Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, attend this seminar, the UQAI uh, Plus seminar series from the algorithms to impacts. It's a great honor to have uh, uh, Professor uh, John Fraser here to give us amazing talk. Before we dive into the uh, amazing talk, let's, let me just uh, acknowledge the um, country. So the University of Queensland UQ acknowledged the traditional owners and their cost uh, custodianship of the lands which on which we meet. We pay our respects to their uh, ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country, and we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Okay, uh, AI Plus seminars is held by UQ AI Collaboratory. Uh, it is uh, aimed at uh, it is aiming at the promotion of the tra uh, trans uh, trans discriminatory uh, AI research and collaboration uh, to connect the UQ AI researchers and uh, students, uh, as well as a good place or opportunity to engage with impact areas such as the health uh, health domain. So this is the AI plus health uh, series topic. Uh, including today, there are two uh, great, great uh, talks on the way. Before I introduce the, uh, uh, Professor jo uh, John Fraser, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Dr. Sun Wang, as well as the ARC DECRA Senior Research Fellow. I'm also the uh, Program Convener of Master of Data Science Senior Lecturer in Computer Science in the School of ITWE. So let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, uh, Professor. Professor John Fraser has uh, many great titles. Um, first, first one is the founder and the director of the Critical Care Research Group, CCRG, at the Prince Charles Hospital and at the University of Queensland. He is also the director of the ICU St. Andrew's War Memorial Hospital, President Asia PAC, Extra Cooper Rural uh, Life Support Organization, find, finding member of the Global Clinical Trial ACMONET and co-chair Queensland Cardiovascular Research Network. And Professor Fraser has a five professorships with major Australian universities, including here at UQ, of course. He has published more than 550 peer-reviewed publications, received over, uh, uh, received uh, over 41 million Australian dollars in competitive grants, delivered over uh, 200 national and international keynotes and lectures. And he is also the senior uh, senior um, editor of the most uh, comprehensive textbook on um, mechanical circulatory support. He has been awarded many international research awards, including the 2018 Australian Society of the Medical Research Award. His multidisciplinary research extends from the basic science preclinical, international clinical, bionic heart and lung, sepsis and the respiratory support in so resources poor countries. Professor Fraser has led Australia's first ever international NHMRC Center for Research Excellence in uh, uh, Artificial Hearts and Lungs. In January 2020, Professor Fraser and his colleagues co-founded the COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium. And this consortium facilitated the collection of more than 35 million data points from the ICU COVID-19 patients across the 54 countries in the world to assist the caregiver to decide treatment pathways for the critically ill. With general support from the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation and Mindaru Foundation, Professor uh, Fraser and his team just developed a, a dashboard with IBM. And the Journal of the Medical uh, American Medical Association uh, appraised the cons consortium's innovative global efforts as a quantum change in data collection in medical research. Now, please allow me to welcome Professor Fraser again for his uh, wonderful talk today. Over to you, Fraser. Just as we're getting up, thanks very much. It's also great to see that even computer people get stuck with PowerPoint sharing screens, so it makes me feel a lot better. Um, so my screen is paused. Is that okay? Yep, good, excellent. You guys will know it. So, firstly, thanks to Xian Xian for coming to find me. Uh, not only can I not work computers, I can't work UQ roads because you keep changing it every two or three minutes, and you think you're 
20 yards away from it and you get there and there's another fence that wasn't there last week. Um, again, to acknowledge the traditional owners, we're not the first uh, scientists, we're not the first caregivers to the people, the people of the younger Antigua people were here many years before we were, so we stand on their shoulders. Um, as we're just getting the um, audio visual sorted, um, I guess, firstly, thank you. Thank you for inviting us out here. St. Lucia is not that far from Prince Charles, which is Australia's largest cardiothoracic hospital, but it could be in a different country. Uh, and the potential when we come together, as I was saying, myself and Chan Chan were talking about in the way forward, we can send emails, we can do Zooms, sometimes we can do Zooms, uh, but the actual act of coming together is where you start to create collaboration. Um, because I remember probably about six years ago, I came across to the IMB building. There's a new scientist there called um, uh, Nathan Palpant. He'd come in from the States and he didn't know any of the clinicians. He didn't realize St. Lucia was quite as far away from uh, the, the hospitals as it was. So I came across for lunch and we basically did speed dating for geeks. So there's a whole pile of great technologies that the biologists had, but they didn't know what they were useful for. And we had a whole pile of problems that we didn't know how to solve them. And the coming together was the start of some of the work using the Fraser Island uh, spider venom for cardiac work. So since then, we've had NHMRC grants. We've done animal studies. We've got pub uh, publications in circulation that's about to start large human randomized control study. All credit to Glenn King and his team, but also the clinicians, because it's the coming together that makes it work. So... We don't see ourselves, I see myself here as a bit of a fraud talking to a pile of experts of artificial intelligence. I can spell it, and that's about it. Um, but the coming together of people with vast amounts of clinical data, lots of clinical problems with your power is what makes it um, exciting. So, so thank you for that. I've put up a whole pile of my initials. I never normally do that. And Jackie Suen, my co-collaborator that started the consortium with us, was kind of, oh, why are you doing this? The reason I put that up specifically is it's the different, the way that medicine works. So I did physician training, anaesthetic training, ICU training, and a PhD in surgery. And it's the bits joining together because the human body is a one. And the knee bone connects to the thigh bone, as your grandmother taught you when you were on her knee. And so each bit of the body talks. And what we're doing in medicine at the moment is we're taking data from every system but it's disjointed. So what I'd love to see in the discussion point here from the artificial intelligence and the vast amounts of data that we're underusing would be how can we bring this stuff together because the body isn't just a heart or just a lung. They all talk to each other. The information we're getting, if we can get this to integrate rather than be separate, then we've got a massive chance for you to change patient outcome. And that patient and intensive care, one in two uh, Australians will end up in intensive care at some point. So this half of the room are going to be in intensive care and this half aren't. So if you want to swap to that side of the room at the moment, it's, it's probably probably this. So, so listen, uh, again, thank you for inviting me over to do this. Hopefully we've got some sound on here. This is an advert I saw about 15 years ago now when Jen Jan and the team asked me to speak about artificial intelligence. We started thinking about what we're trying to say. So this is an advert from a newspaper, actually. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. So, so if you want to leave, I think that's the summary of my lecture. Um, if you look at one angle, you see one thing. Another angle, you see another thing. You need to take a holistic view of it. And we have got so good at monitoring things, too good at monitoring things as Stein's Tronstad data will show, but we're not using it properly to get the entire picture. And if we don't get the entire picture, we get the wrong story. So um, there's a lot of slides. Uh, I'll, I'll, I speak moderately quickly. Uh, so apologies, I can do it in sign as well. Um, about our group, uh, it is a UQ group. We're based at Prince Charles Hospital. It's Australia's largest cardiothoracic hospital. But the key thing is the in this menu is not the main course, which might be a bit stodgy, uh, but the, the, desert, the dessert at the end where we get to listen to you and you can tell us what you think you want to help us with. So our group, we started in 2004. It's an international group, really about changing outcomes. We do basic science, we do engineering science, we do data science, 
things, but it's all about patients. We started at Prince Charles, the critical care, then we had the Gold Coast, the paediatric CCRG, Sunshine Coast CCRG. With our Centre for Research Excellence, we built labs and integration across Australia. And then bit by bit, over the last 10 years, and particularly uh, accelerated in COVID, this is where we've got bases, where we've got scientists, or so where we're working with people. So 65 countries is who are now working with us on the COVID critical dashboard and the, and the data there. We've grown to become the biggest uh, multidisciplinary critical care research group. So it's not about doctors or nurses. We've got engineers, we've got physios, we've got um, rheologists, cell scientists. We've got seven full-time statisticians at the moment. We've got managers, epidemiologists, um, the works. We've got no data scientists. Uh, before COVID, I think we're about 92 staff. Uh, most of them out in our labs. We've got seven purpose-built labs at Prince Charles and Space. Uh, we do have supercomputers that the engineers don't let me touch, which I think is a very, very good uh, thing to do because I'd just break it. Um, our, our mantra, or our aim is really all about patient, patient, patient. We work with our patients to improve the outcome of the patients. Uh, and we use, and patients are incredibly generous. They will give you their data, they'll give you samples, they'll put themselves to additional work because they want to see a better tomorrow. And if we can provide that, that's what our group is trying to do. The patients, as you see from the, 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 the diagram, that's as much mathematics as I could remember, are at the center of everything. And it's all coming together. And perhaps after this, we can put um, you know clever data scientists in there too. I guess we've got four pillars uh, around. So we have an engineering lab. So again, pre-COVID, we've got 22 engineers in there. We work with Matt Dergush, who we just bumped into outside at UQ, QUT and Griffith Engineering. A uh, number of nursing staff and clinical staff. Indy runs the, 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 the data collection from our patients locally. Jan Luigi Labassi, um, trained in the NIH, and he runs our animal lab. Uh, Jackie Swen over here uh, runs the science lab uh, and various other key people within that. But they're the four main groups. Uh, we've become pretty international. Um, as we can, we're again, just chatting on the way here, half of the world comes to uh, Australia, particularly those from the UK. Um, so we've, because of our expertise in the heart and lung medicine uh, and a lot of the things we've done in the last little while, we've become a pretty international place. I think most of these people are, I think almost all of them are all medics. Um, but again, there are engineers that come from all sorts of different countries. But in the last five years, that's the number of people that have come across. Uh, you do have to play football if you come to our group because we do like beating the cardiologists. Um, we were fortunate, uh, fortunate, but we worked hard to get this NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence. Myself and a chap called Daniel Timms had worked in a total artificial heart, a magnetically levitated device, Daniel's device, but myself and he created the company. But we realised how small Australia really was in terms of if Brisbane does its thing and Sydney does its thing and Melbourne does its thing, it's rubbish. So um, this will surprise you, but medics uh, can be a little bit egotistical. Just write that one down. Uh, and they tended to work in their own silos and it just doesn't work. So we got the Centre for Research Excellence and the key thing we did there, we published lots of papers, but the key thing we did there was get all the big cardiothoracic centres across Australia to work together. And so you don't have to do all your work with us, but together we are stronger. Uh, and we leveraged it up from two and a half to about 12 or 13 million and really started to become a powerhouse of mechanical support. Kimmy Ko, um, one of our uh, design colleagues who's joining Stein Tronsad in the ICU of the future, I said, can you look at all the papers and the relationships that came out of this? And we did this graphic. That's not true. She did the graphic. I suggested how to do it. But you'll recognize the kind of graphic from the, the Qantas magazine at the back. This was done during COVID and none of us got to see the Qantas magazine because we couldn't fly anywhere. Um, but this were the number of papers and the number of relationships that came out from that Centre for Research Excellence, a daft number of papers. Um, and here the UQ helped us with this in terms of intensive care medicine. So our publications are not all, I wasn't on all of them by any, any manner of means, but um, number of publications out from UQ was 600 uh, odd. Uh, in terms of the number of publications, the top 10% um, top was almost 20%. So bringing good people together, like we're doing this morning, uh, gets good results. That's really the, the key message there. So that's who we are. Um, and uh, just to introduce my team that have joined us, we've got Hannah Maranen, who's our manager, Lauren Kelly, who's our comms uh, manager, Jackie Swain, who runs the lab, and Stein Tronsad, who's a slightly better footballer than me, but also runs the ICU of the future team. And there's a number of people joining us in line. So um, we were delighted to be asked uh, you know, and we're fascinated by AI, but we don't know, we don't understand it. 
So you're the experts and I'm the fraud. Um, so we, we looked at the literature and there's a fair amount of literature in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and how it can be used in terms of predicting disease severity, detecting the disease, disease severity. And it's about getting in the earlier. Prevention is better than a cure. Prevention is cheaper than a cure. And prevention stops our hospitals filling up so that if you need to get into hospital, there is a spare bed. You'll see all the stories about ambulance ramping at the moment. None of the public hospitals have got space. So it's all about trying to predict, to detect and treat quicker so that we have less lives lost, less years lost, and that the life you have, that you actually thrive and not just survive. So artificial intelligence is able to do this and it allows timely prediction uh, and earlier management. We're getting more and more interested in phenotyping disease. So there's the genotype, and apologies if some of your biologists as well, there's the genotype and the phenotype. Um, the, we have these syndromes in, in medicine that we've just classed based on physiological signs, your pulse rate, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your kidney function, your heart function. So there are syndromes based on the physiology, but not on... Uh, various blood tests or genetics and things like this. So we are now starting to realise that there's different types. There's under-responders, there's over-responders. In the same way your group goes out for drinks, some people can take a bottle of wine and be you know, almost sober, and some people can take a thimble full and be as drunk as a skunk. In the same way, um, there's differentiation. You give the same insult in terms of infection or lung injury, and you can have two different groups of people but we can't predict this at the moment. We've been not able to do this. So acute respiratory distress syndrome is one of the biggest killers. It's severe end-stage lung disease. It's acute lung disease, and this is what's killed the vast majority of people with COVID. But some people get COVID, and they feel like they've got a sore head. They take a couple of Panadol, watch some Netflix, and go back to work a week later. And some people end up in our intensive care dying in artificial lungs. And we haven't been able to determine why that is. But in terms of phenotyping and genotyping, that possibility is becoming possible. In terms of outcomes, there's also possibilities there. What we've tended to do is we've got all these syndromes, so we create guidelines and we do evidence-based randomized control studies to develop guidelines. And that's great. And we see this ventilation strategy works and this drug works which kind of makes sense um, in terms of mechanical ventilation where we put the breathing tube down or in terms of severe infection, sepsis. But the problem is one size doesn't fit all. Uh, we are different. Every one of us is different. We're wearing different clothes, different hairstyles, different that. We're different. So we don't actually fit into everyone needs the same thing. But the question is, how do we then determine what to do so that the treatment we give this side of the room works for this side of the room, the treatment we do this side of the room works for this side of the room. Um, and this is where... Um, reinforced algorithms to optimize mechanical ventilation, for example, works. So we can look at how the body responds to the pressures of ventilation and see that you need this and you need this. In terms of sepsis management, this is a paper by Anthony Gordon in London. They did a validation cohort. Mortality was lowest in patients for whom clinicians' actual doses match the AI decision. So the AI decision didn't actually use it. It was in the background. But when they looked afterwards, the AI decision, the was the best predictor if the clinician was doing the AI decision without seeing it. So the potential is there and medicine is starting to realize that that potential is real. So that's your challenge. This works. These are the areas that we think we've got data, that we think that there's potential that um, deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, better utilization of large volumes of data can change outcome. I'm happy to take questions throughout, but these are I'm going to do as, as we said at the start, a degustation menu and then um, take questions or interrupt me throughout or afterwards, happy with it either. Um, so uh, 2019, we thought was a pretty rubbish old year. There was bushfires. There was a man called Trump that was impeached for his first time. The Amazon was burning and Notre Dame was going down. Thought 2020 was going to be a cracker. We heard of a place called Wuhan. Uh, 2020 was not a cracker. Uh, I'm the president of the Asia Pacific Severe Heart Lung Hospitals, APL, so it's called. And we started getting phone calls. We had people in our lab from Wuhan, and they started telling us end of December, beginning of January, myself and Jackie and Jan Luigi saying, listen, there's a funny flu coming out here. Can you tell us how to ventilate these patients? And I'd seen none. I still have seen almost none. Can you tell us how to do it? You're the president of our society, and I had nothing. I, I couldn't help them at all. 
But we realised there's more and more WhatsApp messages and phone calls come in and our friends crying and the phone, people we'd worked with for years saying, I lost my sister yesterday. So we had to do something. We're sitting in nice, pretty Brisbane doing nothing. So we thought um, the, the first paper that showed the artificial lung ECMO, you're going to hear a lot about ECMO. ECMO basically means you put um, two garden hose pipes, one in the groin on this side, one in the groin on this side, and an artificial lung. So when your lungs are basically broken, we take the blood out, we oxygenate it, remove the carbon dioxide, put it back in. And the early Chinese data said with this specific virus, ECMO does not work. Um, so we've got lots of help calls and we thought, well, we can't really help much. So this took a while to grow, but what we started was we've got, we had a reasonable international group and we put the call out to our friends and saying, look, these data points are, are growing and growing and growing. Soon there's going to be 10, 20, 30 million data points around the world. And if you see it as jigsaw puzzle pieces, I'm a simple man. That's my way of looking at data. There's all jigsaw puzzle pieces across the globe, but no one's putting them together. How about if we all come together, we all chuck our data into one big soup pot and start to find some answers. So week after week, Jackie and Gianluigi and myself to kick off um, started Zoom calls, which started with, I think, five hospitals, then 10, then 15. We peaked at about 250 hospitals. We had to do every week, Thursday night, 9 p.m., Friday morning, 9 a.m. for the West Coast of America, that kind of area. And we... 200 and I think 60 hospitals was eventually, sorry, 400 and something hospitals came together to give data. Um, and it was amazing. Uh, it wasn't about, you know, people forgot about the eye. It was all about the team because we realized if we brought this data together, we could start to find signals. And those signals may help us in this disease that we were seeing the sickest of the sick that we didn't know what to do with. So this photograph was taken or multiple photographs were taken one night when uh, Trump uh, unfunded the World Health Organization because we reckoned we were from 65 countries all around the world. We did health and we were quite organized. And this came in JAMA, which is the Journal of American Medical Association, the most widely read uh, journal medically. And what they said was, this is a paradigm shift in using global data real time to change outcomes. Uh, so we have now got just under 20,000. We were just on the phone this morning. Part of the reason I was touch and go with time to the states where we're um, managing to get coding working on some of the um, EMRs that they built these electronic medical records years ago but actually getting the data out is almost impossible but again with the power of 65 countries we're actually learning from this this shows how our data growth started across the world from 2020 um, uh, and it was just amazing as every country lit up with the data coming uh, from all these different places many of which weren't powerhouses of research. It wasn't the University of Queensland. The people we were most excited to get were Zimbabwe, were Rwanda, were some of the small islands in Indonesia. Um, and it was great just to see people wanting to work together. And this uh, just grew and grew and grew, and it continues to go most recently. And um, we've just got Middle East and North Africa, places that yeah, uh, run out of oxygen on a yearly, on a weekly basis. So it was terrible what happened in India, but this happens in Kenya and Uganda, for example, on a monthly basis. So um, one of the areas, the sickest of the sick go in the breathing machine with a breathing tube, the life support machine. But then once your lungs fail, then uh, we put you in the artificial lung machine as well. Um, and it's very, very expensive. It's very, very resource intensive too. No, keep going. Okay. Um, resource intensive too. So we're taking these really sick people and we're putting them on a device. And until that time, over the last 40 years, it's a really new technology, and we worked with the guy that developed it. Really new technology, but we'd never over 40 years actually categorically shown it worked in a randomized controlled trial, which is our gold standard. Um, and it costs a fortune, and it's hard, it's not, it can cause harm to patients. So um, we started looking at this as well. There we go. So um, this was the EOLA study, New England Journal, Impact Factor 90 or so. I think um, our friend Alan Combs wrote this study. It took him about eight or nine years to do. Um, he could only get uh, 20, 124 in one limb, 124 in the other limb. It was so difficult to uh, consent people and get them on the study. And even at the end of the study, he didn't reach statistical significance. There's different ways of looking at it, but the, it was still an ambivalent story. Uh, again, this technology that's been around for 40 years, the editorials would say, look, you know, extremely low enrollment rate, high crossover rate, um, 
The answer's not clear, but doing another randomized control study is almost infeasible because we think it kind of works, but we actually haven't shown it works. So we might still be wrong. So we suddenly realized that here we were facing this world's biggest pandemic. We can't do randomized control study because you can't get in and out of hospitals easily, but we were doing a technology that's expensive, that was using vast amounts of oxygen and might be killing people. So Eddie um, Fan in Canada, one of our friends, and Martin, in uh, one of his fellows, and a whole pile of international people from our data said, I think we've got the power to be able to answer this in an emulated uh, target trial of ECHO. Um, and that's the, the key thing. It's essentially a virtual randomized control study. The stats are well beyond my ability, and that's why I got Eddie to do the study. But essentially, it was doing a virtual randomized control study where, sure, we weren't in the hospitals, but instead of getting one patient per hospital per year, which is why they were recruiting in the Olea, we had 20,000 patients, of which about 1,500 of them had ECMO. So the power became amazing. And it was done about a year and a half ago. We looked at hospital mortality. Uh, so the key bits in this slide really are the mortality on A and discharge alive on B. And ECMO is the blue line. And um, the conventional medical ventilation is the purple line. So what you see here is ECMO um, in terms of mortality was lower. ECMO in terms of discharge alive was better. So it showed this does work. And then this specific patient population, the mortality difference is above 7%, which is a big difference because um, the mortality was very, very high in some of the subgroups. So it's the data we used, but it took forever without being rude to University of Queensland. Trying to go through the lawyers at the University of Queensland was just appalling. They got so scared. And it's great to publish papers, but what we had said, we'd sat out, started to do was say to our colleagues across the world, we're in Little Old Brisbane, we've got no pressure. What is it you want? And they said, we want access to aggregate data, safely de-identified, but urgently so that we have it in our pocket. So we spoke to IBM and we said, hi, you guys kind of invented um, you know, AI. Uh, can you help us? They said, sure, Fraser, what would you like? What do you need? And I said, I don't need anything, I've got nothing. But I can give you 20 leaders from across the world that are seeing 30% of their patients die on a daily basis. And do what they tell you they want. So this is what we, we came up with. We came up with a dashboard, all credit to those clinicians from across the globe uh, and to IBM who did it all pro bono. A dashboard on your phone or on your tablet where you didn't have to get out of your PPE to go in and out to the library, where you can just put in data. So you, let's say you've got a patient at three in the morning and you've got a patient uh, on the bed space and you're not sure what to do with. This won't tell you what to do. So just so the UQ lawyers aren't listening. Uh, this won't tell you what to do, but it'll say, if your patient is 65, we're going to give you 3,000 patients who are 65, between 60 and 70, whose oxygen levels were below 80% and their kidney function was wrong. This is what happened to the majority of them. 97% went on to require this. If this was done, then this happened. So it told you what was done, and the clinician could do with that data whatever they wanted. We weren't, and specifically, there's a, a tick and flick sheet, and Ryan Cole, uh, from uh, the cybersecurity department here in Sierra Flame were outstanding uh, and great credit to them. We got this far with this. So um, we created this dashboard. It's still now Bill and Melinda Gates have taken that over um, through a company called Iridia, and they were now making a network of databases from across the world called ICODA, I-C-O-D-A. We learned a lot about how best to treat um, the patients with COVID. Uh, we looked at factors that would contribute to mortality that weren't coming in conventional statistics. We see lots of papers from America, but if you're in Indonesia, does that matter? You know, it, you know, we talk about um, the inequity. What is the inequity when we saw COVID? And we found out all these things, and could we build a tool that could help you make your decision, not to tell you what to do, but to give you more data? We all like data to make decisions. If I go to a patient in bed one and their blood pressure is this, I will decide how to treat it based on the last 20 years of my experience. But if I also, but I haven't seen much COVID. But if I've got 20,000 patients' data on my phone sitting, that will be useful for me to decide how to do it. Um, so in four decades, as I say, we did four randomized control studies and didn't come out with an answer. But in two years, in the world's biggest pandemic, where the place in hospitals is an absolute schmozzle, I love listening to people during COVID. They said, oh, I was so bored. There was nothing to do. I wish we did nothing to do. We were, we were at our busiest time ever. Um, so we learned a huge amount across a pandemic. Uh, we hope it never comes again, but it probably will. Uh, and Bill and Melinda Gates has funded us particularly, partly for what we've done with COVID, but also they've said, look, the way you've done this is different. You know, the way we see it is we've built a Maserati 
and the data that we're using at the moment is the petrol from COVID petrol. Uh, but the, but once COVID hopefully goes away and the next pandemic or the next study that we want to do about myocardial infarctions or diabetes, there's 300 million diabetics, the kind of tool and the rapidity of access to data and the democratization of data is incredibly powerful for what comes next. So that's COVID. But then also in the Asia Pacific region, uh, Post-COVID, we're very, very excited what we can do here. Asia is the growth place. We're part of it, um, uh, and it's the growth place. But the ECMO community, Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, really doesn't get much of the data that from ELSO, so um, from Asia Pacific ELSO. And we've asked, and we said, why don't you give the data? Well, we have to pay to give the data. It then goes into the, it's based in America, goes into the database there, and then we have to pay to use our own data. And it's very non-democratic. It's like, well... Why should that person in an office in Michigan decide what I do in Seoul? Does, doesn't make sense. Um, so, but the number of, this is the global number, the use of artificial lung technology is dramatic, a thousand percent increase in about five years. Um, and again, the data behind it is not actually that strong. Um, so we have looked at why are 60% of the global population uh, not putting more data and we've got a massive, massive population here. And what we're capturing at the moment is relatively benign and it's an iceberg. And if we can do a better data capture, then the power of answering questions, so it doesn't take us 40 years, it doesn't take a pandemic, we get to answers much, much more quickly because we think across just Asia Pacific, there's about 20,000 runs, but people don't put the data in. So why is the data not going in? Fear of other countries stealing it, especially in Asia Pacific, the politics are really, really tricky. Um, it takes too long. You're a clinician and you're exhausted. Do you really want to stay for another two hours? People did it during COVID, but you know, you could see the fatigue. The first six months, people were just working their butts off to get that data. And then it's like, we're just tired. So can we get the data in quicker? Um, uh, again, Asia Pacific is difficult because we have different languages and we work pretty hard and it's difficult sharing things and accessing collated data. So um, uh, Jackie Swen is from Hong Kong, uh, stole uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream. Uh, I think that's a little bit of cultural appropriation by Jackie, but there you go. Um, and basically create a tailor-made registry um, to allow sites, to allow sharing of data, but the sites, and be fascinated to hear your thoughts, because we'll probably get some of this wrong, uh, to retain ownership of data. So a federated approach whereby the data comes in from the different countries into a virtual workbench. Um, the data goes in more easily. So we're looking at optical character recognition with our colleagues in Japan. We've got lots of monitors around. We're going to hear Stein, uh, some of Stein's work, taking data from all these monitors more simply into the, the data bank. So how do we get the federated data? You've got a number of different countries. They put their data onto the workbench, but it's a federated approach in terms of each place gets their own ethics, then they decide whether they want to put the data in, which data they want to go in, and which uh, participation in the committee, the Asia Pacific Committee, which is made up of all the member state countries from across this area, so the power is huge. Um, and what they can roughly do is decide the data is pulled onto the workbench and it's conducted at site. So the arm, and again, you guys will probably understand this better than we do, but the data is conduct, the analysis of your data is conducted at site. It doesn't go into the main table so that China might be able to steal your data. It sits in Taiwan, it sits in Korea, it sits in Japan. And the, the question is sent out to your database, works on there, and then the answer comes back and then that's all accumulated. So it's never transferred at the individual database, which is something, again, we built this talking to our member states across this area. And it can create a country-specific report, or you can create a trans-Asian report. Um, so, yeah, area-specific. And then what we can also do is we don't want to be nasty to the mothership of ELSO in the States. This can also go and inform the global database. So it's useful at your own country level, at the Asia Pacific level, and at the global level uh, with a huge, and then it comes out there. Data acquisition. So medics uh, across Asia Pac are frequently working 80, 90, 100 hours, uh, and the chance of getting them to do extra unpaid stuff is, is tricky. So we've got monitors everywhere. There's electronic medical records that were built by companies that don't really want us to get data out. They're very poorly made. There is a whole pile of different machines that are built by different companies, none of which talk to each other. So this machine, as I've said, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone, not an intensive care, it's not. The machines are all different and they don't talk to each other because different companies sell the new one, the cheapest one, the brightest colored one. So all these data are important, 
but we can't bring them in. Um, so the question is, how do we bring the data into a warehouse from all these different pieces of equipment? So uh, this slide is showing how that we need to make it really, really simple and that anyone can do it. This was me having put uh, one of our animals on ECMO. Um, so this is how it works. And again, it's our colleagues in Japan have created this, basically using a, a smartphone and um, with optical character recognition, where the optical character recognition, instead of reading, uh, writing down those 52 uh, different numbers, and this is a real-time demonstration of it, it takes the numbers from this and puts it straight in. Now, this is just a beta type version at the moment, but it seems to be pretty effective. But again, with so many disparate things not talking to each other, this has got the potential. It may not be perfect, but it'll be a lot better than sitting someone in front of a monitor writing things down. Th these are the kind of numbers, and again, I'll talk about it briefly, but these are the kind of numbers that if we can bring them all together, and um, this gives us you know, a spreadsheet of this and the data that, that can come out of this, it is an international working group with a, a brilliant a young Hong Kong doctor, Pauline, uh, running it, um, and it's a very trans-Asian. So uh, our things normally start with a problem with the patient. The COVID thing is a great example. There's a problem with patients. We don't know what to do, help. We collected data. We made a whole pile of answers. So far, there's 15 papers come out of that database, and there's another 20 or so coming, some of them in impact factors, 20s, 30s, 40s. And it has built Australia into probably one of the, from the crit care end, end of things, it's built us into the biggest area across the world, which is interesting when Brisbane had none of the disease. Before, so we do clinical, the patient, the, the problem comes from the patient, but then sometimes we have to go to basic science to answer it. And again, we're chatting to Shansa and a lot of the, the problem with St. Lucia is that there's brilliant basic scientists, but the patients are over there to try and do medical research without patients is a little bit like trying to drive a car without wheels. Patients are really important to it, but also the physiology before we go on to patients. So um, we have got a very large animal lab. It's all done humanely, um, whatever. But in terms of creating scenarios or platforms to investigate a disease. So if you have a heart attack, what's the best support mechanism? If you've got a lung dysfunction, what's the best? This? If you're involved in a car crash, we can't, we can't consent people and involve them in car crashes. We can humanely and respectfully and ethically do that with animals and be able to investigate everything. So we have an engineering lab, and um, we'll talk about that briefly, where we can do a whole pile of mock simulations of circulatory systems, pressure volume loops and this, and then walk literally 500 yards down the hill without the road problems that you have here at St. Lucia where you keep closing things on and off and look at the physiology with the patient, the sheep or the pig, as a control, and then experimental, and then collect all these data. Um, this uh, picture here was taken about three weeks ago, so heart transplant, uh, one of our areas. We're not just doing animal research for the sake of doing animal research. I don't think there's a vet in this room, but what there are is there's the chap, I think that's probably him here, David McGiffin. David did the first ever human heart transplant in Queensland. Lovely guy coming to the end of his career. And I said, I've got an idea to use this rig so that we can get more heart transplants. So the number of people that needs heart transplants is doing this, it, it going up. The number of donor hearts is staying the same because the donor heart in the, in the donor is so badly damaged. So we thought if we could use a rig to perfuse it and oxygenate it, fill it with medical Gatorade, if you like, when you transport it from Perth, to take it to the recipient in Brisbane, we thought this might be able to solve or give more people a chance to life. And we did exactly that for four years. NHMRC supported about 52,000 hours by our uh, biology and animal team led by Jack and Gianluigi. Uh, we showed that we can keep a heart alive. Normally, you can keep a heart alive out of a body for about three hours. We got up to 11 hours using this rig. That's great. It's a lovely paper. Someone's CV gets good, a couple of PhDs, but that's irrelevant to us as medics. The question is, how does that affect Betty down the hill? So we then went and presented our data to the transplant physicians who know that there's people dying every day for lack of a transplant. And since then, we've done 22 humans with a transplant that would have never received a transplant, including a PhD student in Perth, um, who's 23 years old, and the heart was retrieved in Hobart, put on a rig, perfused, oxygenated medical Gatorade, and it took almost eight hours. It's the longest ever a heart or an organ has been outside the body and been transplantable. So the ability to translate what we find here with the high-end monitoring is, is phenomenal. Again, we work with the Centre for Advanced Imaging here too to do some stuff. But this is just a, a graphic of the kind of things that we can investigate. So in terms of data, the volume of data that's coming out of these studies, some of these studies go for 96 hours 
So again, all credit to people in the animal lab, it's doctors, it's nurses, it's um, scientists giving the care. So our animals get way more high level intensive care treatment than our humans because we that's the way we mandate it, that there has to be a senior person in the lab every second of the day. But in terms of how the lung's working, well, we've got, you know, 100 hertz data is the kind of data of this. And this isn't all of the data that we can get, but we've got a gazillion things happening at the same time. And we do a very, very basic analysis um, of, of what's happening. And I guarantee when we start looking at patterns, if we get better at it, you'll be able to tell us things that we're entirely missing. So, um, this is looking at heart function, lung function, kidney function, oxygen delivery function, um, uh, heart lung pump function. We also have before. So when we did the artificial heart, we did, we've got an engineering lab where we develop develop uh, simulations of how the heart will respond to different things. So we get a, we get a, a scenario, a clinical scenario. We put it on the mock loop. Let's say from a heart attack. We see what will happen. Then we can intervene with the device. That Before that, there's computer simulation. We then develop a part of a pump, and then we go down to the animal lab. So the animal is the last stage prior to humans, but we minimize our use of animals by using a lot of very clever engineering techniques. Um, this is what an engineer thinks a, a heart looks like. So this is um, our mock circulation loop. So you've got the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart. This is a, a glycerin solution, 42%. It's the same viscosity as your blood count in your blood vessels. So we can see the pressure volume changes. We can see what happens when you put different um, pumps in to support it that are used clinically. And some of the pumps we're using clinically have got very little data that we've got. This is the, the world leading one that we've actually now built in Texas for the Americans, in Aachen and in Malaysia too. So having the engineers right beside the patients, we took them out of QUT and said, look, you're brilliant, but you're developing the wrong things. We have a question, but we've got no ability. And we believe we've got the ability, but they don't know the questions. So this is young Andrew who did his PhD with us. And this is about 200 yards from the cardiac operating theater and 300 yards from the intensive care. So rather than read about it, they actually go into the theaters, meet, see the operations, see the patients. We tell them what the problem is. They've got their own dedicated labs down there. I'm not going to go through all this, but um, again, this is the labs that, that Jackie runs, and we've got a whole pile of international um, rock stars looking at different things with heart failures, aortic valves that you can put, instead of having your chest cracked open for a valve, we can now put them in through a, a keyhole in your groin on a wire, uh, and we, we lead a lot of the work on there. Heart transplantation, we're changing the way it's done, uh, and various different things. People, the highest cause of death in intensive care is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Again, we're looking at phenotypes there and a whole pile of other things. From the engineering aspect, again, won't go through them, but these are the kind of projects where the engineers, so you've got clinicians, scientists, and engineers doing all this, but we don't have data scientists, which is interesting. We've talked a little bit about this. This is artificial, and uh, this is acute respiratory distress syndrome. One in three patients with this dies. It's got a massive mortality. It's been around for 52, 53 years, really since intensive care started. And we've not actually changed. There's no magic bullet. There's no treatment. But we've realized that what happens is um, that we've just said we're all the same. So boys and girls, you're all just humans. But not surprisingly, boys and girls have got different thoughts about different things. That's the same with the ARDS. And we're starting to learn to phenotype this, which people have shown in a post hoc analysis of other data changes outcome. But there's no platform to investigate this, no platform to investigate trial drugs. So we've created a platform of different phenotypes of acute lung injury whereby we can treat with drug A or drug B and then move on to human. So again, globally, the intensive care community is excited looking at the cluster analysis. Uh, again, it's a fantastic graphic. Uh, I really don't understand the statistics behind it, but thankfully we've got a number of statisticians that are very, very helpful. And it's showing us protein signatures that differentiate between the over inflamed group and the under inflamed group. And again, without this level of statistical power, the biologists would have got nothing. So that's kind of hardcore science. I, I think the, on a daily basis that we see patients are in intensive care. Um, so intensive care is done very well in Australia. Firstly, if you end up in intensive care in Australia, your chance of survival is very, very high. Let me just show you a couple of little videos. This gives you an idea of what happens.
So intensive care is a scary place to be. You're at your weakest. Um, you've lost all your autonomy and uh, you're sore, you're confused, you're agitated, um, but you survive very well. Lots and lots each year. It's incredibly expensive uh, for our society. We've got great survival records now in Australia, but the question is survival is not enough. We have to give them, survival has to be worthwhile. Um, when you're in intensive care, you have different organ dysfunction. Your heart's dysfunctional. We can measure it. We can do blood tests, CCGs, echoes. Your lungs are dysfunctional. We can look at oxygen levels. We can look at chest aches. You can do CD. Kidney function, look at your urine output. Brain dysfunction. If, if you've had a stroke, we can see it, but there's a acute reversible brain failure, which is called delirium. It's not dementia. It's entirely different. Mum, 20-year-old, goes in. The brain becomes agitated. They got all these hallucinations that you saw in that little video. Spiders crawling up walls. The nurse is trying to kill me. All these things. And it's incredibly frightening for the patient and the relative. But it's more than that. We didn't realise because we don't have a measuring stick to measure delirium. There's no blood test to see you're 80% delirious. So we started looking to develop an app to try and screen for delirium. And then we actually realized how big a problem it was. It wasn't just something that, don't worry, your dad will get better. If you get delirium in an intensive care, your risk of getting post-traumatic stress is higher than that of a Vietnam veteran. And we've created that. It wasn't a bomb in a field in Nha Trang. It was us. It was us in intensive care. Uh, almost 80% of them have got cognitive dysfunction. One in three won't go back to work. Uh, and the, even the families, the relatives suffer from the anxiety part that comes from it too. Why? So your organs are becoming dysfunctional. And again, the knee bone connects to the thigh bone. Your heart's sick, your lungs are sick, your brain's sick, your kidney's sick. They all connect. But the environment is a massive contributor because we've built the ICU around what we need. The doctor, the nurse, the allied health wants the patient to be visible, wants all the monitors to be in display. But we haven't actually thought of what the patient needs. So the lights are on 24-7. During the daytime, they're too dark to read. During the nighttime, they're too bright to sleep. The noise is absurd. There's no natural connect. There's no natural light. Most of the time, because you need to be able to see everything, there's very little privacy. And we looked at the incidence of alarms. The noise in an intensive care, even if you don't have a loud Scottish professor there, is phenomenal. Stein, again, did some great uh, acoustic engineering and monitoring. And what we saw was during the daytime in an average intensive care, you've got about 60 to 65 decibels, which is the same as trying to be asleep in the middle of a motorway. At your sickest time, we're saying sleep's important. We'll put you in the middle of a motorway during the daytime. You think, well, okay, that's daytime. But again, nighttime is so fractioned. But if you look at nighttime, the number of bing, 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 the number of times that peaks above 18, 85 decibels is 16 times an hour, which is the equivalent of having a Victor lawnmower start beside your head every couple of minutes. So the concept of trying to recover and get sleep, and we know what we're like when we don't get sleep. We know what jet lag's like when you fly overseas. Imagine this going on day in, day out for 30 days. And it's because we haven't thought of the design or the patient, we've built it around ourselves. About 95% of all the noise around a patient that happens around the bedside because we've built it like an operating theatre. The monitor's here, the ventilator's here, the infusion pumps are here so that we can see them all. But once the alarm goes off, the patient can't do a backhand and switch it off or change the ventilation or increase the adrenaline dose. But we've done it for us, some incredibly. So this stops the patient sleeping. This is an example, just a, that's a standard example of an ICU bed space. This is one of our patients who was heart transplanted as has done very, very well, but who's stuck with chronic alcoholism that's new, who's got depression, who's never gone back to work. So we fixed them, but we broke them. Now, uh, why is that relevant to, to you guys? Well, we looked again, Stein's data, we looked at 20 beds in 31 days and alarms are important, but they're only important if they make us do something. We measured 600,000 alarms in the space of 31 days from one piece of equipment. Um, so each monitor, a new alarm, an alarm in every 80 seconds. And in each pod, so it's an open bay, every nine seconds, a different alarm went off. Only 5% were actually actioned. 95% silence, silence, silence. But it's easier to add things in medicine to try and say, can we take that alarm away? Uh, take an alarm away? That's a patient safety risk. Well, we never do anything except press it off. But that takes data and power and the analysis of data. Sleep. Sleep's incredibly important to all of us. Um, at best, you'll see ICU patients get fractured sleep between three and five hours a day on blocks of five to 10 minutes. I don't know if anyone's got an, a six-monther. But just imagine having a six-month or having pain and chest strains coming out. Um, 
the number of times nurses get involved in activities through the night is 43. That's an absurd. And we know that the problems of, we, we know how rotten we hate not having sleep, but these are the problems that can happen when you don't get sleep. Your brain doesn't work. We know you need sleep. We don't know why you need sleep, but we know it's an incredibly important part. So we can show you, once you get less sleep, you have an increased mortality. Your wounds, even your, even your visceral tissue, a wound heals less well if you don't get sleep. Cognitive dysfunction, psychological dysfunction is hardly surprising. It's not just the patient and the relative, but the clinician hates it too. What we see now is the average age of a nursing staff in intensive care in Australia is 56. And it'll be worse after uh, COVID because so many, maybe not again, not so much in Queensland, but the rest of the country and the rest of the world, you can either go and get a pretty average wage and do night shifts for the rest of your life and have 600,000 alarms going off every time and not be able to sleep when you go back. Or you can just say, you know what, that's it, I'm out. So intensive care is great, but it's dependent on the nurse. And if we can't attract nurses because the environment is so bad and we cause burnout, then we're stuck there. So the, the, the key thing, I guess, the, the take home from this aspect is the amount of data points that we create each day is just absurd. And yet humans only really take um, use of fewer than six data points. Again, this is Stein's work, six data points when they go and assess a patient. But there are thousands of data points available. And the question is, how do we, we contend with a minimum of just under 250 variables on each patient? So the decision fatigue, if you've got 15 or 20 patients and also not got enough beds and also having a disease that we don't quite know what to do with, there's the amount of data, whether it's the the COVID database, the ventilators, the monitors, et cetera, is absolutely huge. And this continuous noise affects the patient and the relative and the lighting, but it also affects the way you think as well. We know that in a better environment, you think better um, as well. So it means that probably our decisions are not the best decisions that could be there. So there's the problem. What's the solution? We started working with patients. Again, you've heard from right from the kickoff. Patients are at the center. So we had a meeting. This was several years ago. Um, we had some of the hospital builders. Hospitals are built on an ABC model, architect, builder, and CEO. The patient's never involved, which is crazy. Because if you think of a restaurant, uh, you always find out what the customer wants. But here you didn't. So we brought patients in. They talked about their delirium. They talked about the fact this young lady here um, uh, was an outstanding lady. She had a heart-lung transplant. Um, and we thought she was a... She was our poster girl. She was amazing. She was a model. She'd gone out, she'd done this. And she came and she spoke to us. And I looked after her, so this is as much my fault as anyone else. And she said, every night when I go to sleep, I wake up crying because I get the delirium flashbacks. And I cry every night. And every time I come near the hospital, I hyperventilate. And we broke her. And I'd never thought of this. Another patient there called, was in a bed for 30 days, said, you've got all the space. You can't sit up because you're too weak. And all he did for 30 days was join the dots in the ceiling to try and make diagrams. Imagine that, you know what it's like in a bad flight. Imagine doing that for 30 days and nights not being able to sleep. And we got the builders and we got the, the people that make the monitors to be part of it and say, this, we can co-design this to put this patient at the center of it uh, to help with the design, the architecture, to help with the technology. So, yep. So roughly what we're going to do is take these data, and this is a question to you guys, take these data um, from all these pumps to integrate the clinical data, make a silent intensive care, not a quiet, sorry, a quiet intensive care, not a silent, but create an area around the patient where they can sleep, where all these data are removed, some really, really simple things to be able to do it. Integrate the data, use these data with smart displays and take them across, use sensors that are less Imagine having wires all plumped across here. We can use uh, wireless technology to do it too. Um, we can do this. We've actually got two bed spaces. We've got a prototype built, a physical prototype. You'd be welcome to come and have a look. And we've now got two bed spaces that we're going to build. And we're going to take data off the patients in terms, of, in terms of sleep quality, in terms of rapid eye movement, in terms of all sorts of things. We're going to allow virtual visiting. We created this before COVID, but the worst thing about COVID, one of the worst things about COVID was people were dying without seeing their relatives. And we can do virtual visiting. It's so simple. We all do Zoom and WhatsApp and wherever. Um, but we haven't done this. Um, I, and we can do a lot of telemedicine too. One of the areas we're really excited is, is using artificial intelligence to get more data from the monitors. We can predict. So if I go past the monitor and say, oh, they did one funny extra beat. And then an hour later, well, they get two extra beats. But if you have got a Google Glass inter interface and we started chatting to Google about this, so I think it's a huge potential. The ventilators, we can predict who's going to block the breathing tube. We can predict who's going to burst their lung. And you look back and you think, should have picked that. But if we've got a way of taking these data in 
analyzing and you build the knowledge base, the machine learning, then we have the opportunity to create not just a better ICU, but a smarter ICU. So one is two Australians are there. Um, and I'll just stop. So I guess to, to finish, um, the group is big, it's there, um, and it's one in two of you. And the Nirvana is uh, to you, the question to you is, we can, where our Nirvana, what we want is automated data cleaning, built-in system to run emulated trials, better data presentation, quicker data presentation. And this is an opportunity for you to help us try and improve outcomes because one in two of you will be in our ICU. Thank you. Absolutely. We're UQ. We're, you're UQ. We're UQ. Yep. You can deal with the lawyers, but yes. Uh, and uh, Ryan Cole was fantastic. But yes, they're absolutely. There's 20,000 data set. And again, Hannah can talk to it, but universities, it's housed at University of Queensland. Yeah. The, so we use Mimics. Graduation based. Yeah. Uh, we, so Simon Forsyth uh, is maybe online, I'm not sure. Simon was an outstanding, um, what department is, he's like mathematics and computers, he's really clever. Um, so Simon runs a red cap database and it's there and it's accessible to anyone that wants to use it with the right ethics. So it's already de-identified. All done. And we've been using it across. So what, what happens is our international people, we can't send out to them. They create their question, they create their code on mimics. They do this, they send it in to our statisticians and to Simon. They then run it on red cap and then they get the answer back out. Amazing talk. Um, anybody that's tried to collaborate even with one other university knows the pain of getting data together from multiple institutes. I'm just amazed of how this happened across all these different countries. And I'm Wondering if you've got any, you know, top three tips of how this could happen in other domains outside of health, if you're looking for something global to happen across different countries. Looks, it's a great question. I think, so Winston Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. And I don't think this would have happened without COVID. Uh, the medical fraternities, the intensive care is, you know, you're at home, you're at the GP, you're in the emergency department, you're in the ward, you're in ICU, then you die. So we were the last step. And we had, uh, one of the analogies I said was, it's like giving us your mum or dad uh, in the back of our car. We're driving at 200 miles an hour with, with blindfolds on. And the only way we can see better is with data. So no one asked for money. No one demanded first authorship. No one was a, a tosser. People just said, right, we need to do this. And it was a beautiful thing as a medic, seeing the reason that we all hopefully went into medicine was to try and improve outcomes. So it was totally different. Uh, and we'll have to wait and see. But I think what medics have gone is, oh, wow, as you've said, this is normally awful. It's my data. It's my data. It's my data. Give us 20,000 patients. Give us 45 million data points. We can answer questions. We're about making patients do better. That's the way to do it. So I do think there will be a change. Again, the Gates Foundation said, we're paying you to this for COVID, but my goodness, if you could keep the 65 countries with the richest and the poorest all talking together. One of the studies, we looked at disparities of outcome. If you end up in intensive care in Africa with COVID, your mortality is 80, 80%. Oceania, 12%. This, this concept of the global citizen is nonsense. So, yep, just lots of hard work and don't sleep. Uh, Joe, you want a question? Tony Chen said, uh, thank you for a very amazing talk. I have two questions. First one is, how do we get access to data? You speak to Hannah Maranen, who's here. Uh, I'm going to put her mobile phone in the text group. No, not really. Uh, I wouldn't mess with her. I tried it once and she killed me. Like, not in a bad way. Um, uh, you can chat to us. I think our, our we've got a... I said put a QR code. I've got cards. And just because we're coming to the clever computing people, we got cards with... A QR code. So there you go. Um, I'll leave some cards here, but um, chat to Hannah um, in terms of the, of the access because it is incredibly powerful. We have a steering committee, so the requests, we go through a steering, and again, it's international. It's from North, South, Rich, Poor, Boys, Girls, um, to say this is the question, and we will say yes or no, this or someone else is doing the same thing. Don't do that. Work with them. One of the great things actually was 
one of the neural questions, brain stroke post COVID, a group from Italy said, we think this, and a group from Johns Hopkins said, we think this. And I said, well, you can do two different studies, but that's pointless. Why don't you work together? And in fact, it was a UQ med student that was the first author with Hopkins, Genoa, and he won the European Intensive Care Award. We, you know, again, in a crisis, we want to bring out new leaders, not old Scottish guys in charge of an Asian society. It makes no sense whatsoever. Again, fantastic presentation. Oh, I think, sorry, I see, see Tony's just come up with his second question. Maybe you want to ask. What is UQ's role in that project? <laughs> There's a political question. So, uh, 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 so I've got my full professorships here. The REDCap database is based here. Uh, Simon Forsyth has been outstanding. There's another guy called Sam Hinton, who actually started, created the first stage of the database on his um, honeymoon and would like to apologise to his wife right here and now. Uh, but most of the, the, the study sponsors... Come on, I'll use the microphone. Um, so yes, UQ are the study sponsors of the COVID project. So all of our DSAs go through Oxford and Oxford and UQ work together in a in another big collaboration as well. So that's UQ's role. Um, that's how they fit into COVID. My question is, um, again, sorry, fantastic presentation. And it's obvious that you've got phenomenal data fantastic ideas about different technology and different ways to be able to present that to clinicians to be able to help them make better decisions for your patients from what you're saying there are lots of different platforms different apps different uh, ways of getting that data to clinicians is there a potential for clinicians to be overwhelmed with the number of apps and the number of solutions and the number of things that now that technology is now bringing to try and give you more help and bring more solutions to you Absolutely, but that's what happens at the moment. These 96 pieces of machines give us data, but there's what there's no one feed. And that's the point. Instead of using this gazillion points of data, we might use six. And it, and we just go too much, too much. You know, computer says no, and we and we and it's not used. So we have to be we have to speak to the clinicians to what they what they want. So when we did all this at the start and we created this red cap data and it was amazing. We spoke to IBM and they said, we're going to do this amazing computer thing. And I said, I don't understand computers. Make it simple, but make it what the clinician wants. And credit to IBM. They went and we gave them 20 clinicians from across the globe that were being affected at the height of the pandemic and said to, said to IBM, go and talk to them. Ask them what they want. Ask them what's usable rather than this is what a computer person wants. Because at three in the morning, I guarantee you, we won't understand. So they did it in an iterative process. We can do this. No, we'd like this. We can do this. Tack, 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 tack. And they spent, you know, um, three or four months just speaking to the key clinicians across the globe. And the feedback was amazing because it was co-designed with computer people and the people that are actually using the data. Yep, you can chat to Stein about this later. So what we're actually done, really simple things at the start is Stein's taken from the monitors the, the noise from here and thrown it to the bottom of the bed. It's not particularly hard, but it drops the sound that the patient hears by 50%. If you can drop the volume by 50%, but this is the opportunity for people like you guys to say from the data, how can we use these data quicker? And rather than give 600 data points, give them a, an aggregate of a something. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, one last question from our online listener. Uh, he asked, uh, what are the common AI algorithms utilized in this project? Um, well, I guess, I mean, I've heard AI described as just really clever statistics. Um, so we've got a pile of statisticians that are much better than this. So there, I've really presented three or four different projects. The COVID has given us a chance to look at how COVID affects lungs, hearts, how best to ventilate, what the predictor are, who's getting oxygen, where the oxygen supply chain has fallen down. We're working with the Wellcome Trust on this too. So from the COVID, it was just vast amounts of data and then teasing it apart. But that will then probably create the next platform for randomized controlled studies. In the ICU of the future, the question is, all these data that are coming at us as this continuous feed that you've talked about, that you just, ah, oh, it's too much. If we use a cloud-based system, my thinking is if we have a Google Glass type system, we can look at the monitors every hour. 
and it will see changes in the ECG rhythm that I wouldn't be able to predict. Or with the drug infusions that we go in, uh, I think it's one in four people get a drug miss error problem. So when we put penicillin in a bag to give you, two nurses must stop, they must check the drug, duck, 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 duck. What we're looking at doing now is putting QR codes in the bag. You have a you have a Google Glass type thing, talks to it, says, uh, this is for Steintronstad, this is penicillin, his date of birth is this, he's not allergic to this, you must start the infusion at this. And the ability on your phone, to, yes, 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 yes. It drops the cost by half. You don't need two nursing staff, you need one person. And the chance of making a mistake, if you've got two nurses at three in the morning, they're both exhausted. But the, the computer's not exhausted. And the ability to, to make absolutely certain, looking at the waveforms and being able to predict as a breathing tube starts to block with pus, and it happened a lot. Once it blocks, you've got a minute or so till someone competent can come and change that breathing tube. But the pattern of airflow in it changes bit by bit by bit. But at three in the morning, you've maybe got a very junior doctor. But if you've got something like a Google Glass there, it's saying the slope of the curve, which increases increased obstruction, is changing each hour. You've got one hour to go and do this. Okay. So if we do not have any questions, well, I will be wrapping up here. And thanks again. Professor John Fraser giving us uh, such a wonderful talk today and uh, thanks everyone attending this uh, seminar. So thank you. Thanks.